afternoon for the, for the third go around. So I want to thank you all very much for hanging in here and being, being part of it. Um, we're going to be a little more focused and uh, move a tad away necessarily from the pure waterfront to parks on the waterfront and one in particular, but one that's also a poster child. Um, I'm Alexander Brash from the National Parks Conservation Association. And in a minute after I frame out the issue, I'm going to introduce you to the panel, the esteemed panel. Um, before we do that, for all of you who haven't, this is certainly my first time in this room. I mean, take a moment to admire the room. It's pretty amazing. Um, and with that also, again, thank you to NWA for setting all this up. I'm going to start with a larger issue because we're going to look at a particular New York park, waterfront park, um, but we're going to look at it in a larger context, and that is the context of an urban national park, which are not a unique species at all. Um, and we're going to start with this slide, which isn't about parks at all. What this slide is, has been put together by the Regional Plan Association and America 2050, and it is a slide that shows you what, what a view of America in the year 2050, and it shows you that in these highlighted regions called urban mega regions, 85% of Americans will live in these regions. And therefore, one says, what does this have to do with gateway? Uniquely to these mega regions, if you then impose upon these mega regions, the United States is 393, but maybe we're 394, 95 today, national parks. You find that almost half of them are in fact within these urban mega regions and what we would call urban national parks. And yet, these urban national parks, for the most part, are not the iconic western parks. They're not the great landscapes. They're not the ones that so many people that we read about and hear about and so forth take these big trips to. But in fact, 85% of Americans, these will be their national parks. And so what we want to talk a little bit about today, and using Gateway as our poster child, is what's the difference and why. Gateway, for those of you who know, is 26,000 acres covering two states, including Sandy Hook, it's along Staten Island, Jamaica Bay, Floyd Bennett Field, Breeze Beach, um, Fort Tillman, Breezy Point, a couple of islands offshore. 26,000 acres in total. That is roughly 13% or equivalent to 13% of New York City. Um, and one piece in particular I would point out that we've been spending a lot of time looking at is Floyd Bennett Field, which is 1,400 acres um, lying on the south side of Brooklyn and Queen, of Brooklyn and Queens, an ideal site for a flagship park. But since its creation in 1972, Gateway, like many of the other urban national parks, um, has great potential, but still has big issues. Created in 1972 and signed into law, if you remember, that was only about two years after President Ford told New York City to drop dead. Um, and since then, while it was created and authorized to get over $92 million, which in today's money is equivalent of about either half a billion to a billion dollars for restoration, refurbishment, and a new park idea. That money was never appropriated. That money was never invested. And so today, with some exceptions, and as we've been here, some of the good stuff has gone forward, there's a huge gap of stuff of, that has been unfunded. And so Gateway lies, I would say, as one of New York City's greatest assets, one of the region's greatest assets, but hugest, hugest unfunded potential. To discuss that, we have with us today, I'm starting right here, Destry Jarvis, you've got all the name tags, um, Mike Casey from the National Park Service, Commissioner for the New York Harbor Parks, Robert Perrine down at the far end from the Regional Plan Association, Oliver Spellman next to him from the National Parks Conservation Association, and Bradley Tusk, um, strategic consultant, but actually hidden beneath all that, he's a true parky um, and has lots of insights. So, um, with that, what I'm going to ask each in turn to speak about is more or less pretty simple questions, but more or less, why has the dream of Gateway as an urban 
National Park not realize or reach its potential? And how do we more or less fix the problem and gather its thoughts? So with that, let me turn over to our first speaker, Destry Jarvis. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I've spent uh, the last 38 years in Washington, D.C. as an advocate for the National Park System and various roles, including eight years uh, as a political appointee in the Clinton administration as assistant director of the National Park Service, but mostly as an outside advocate working for variety of nonprofit organizations. For the last eight years, I've had my own consulting business, um, again working for nonprofits and Indian tribes on matters related to the national park system. I started two months after Gateway was designated as a unit of the national park system. Uh, October of 1972, two units of the system, as they're called, are now 393 units of the national park system. Two units were designated at the same time. Gateway here in New York, Golden Gate National Recreation Area in San Francisco. They were meant to be twins on the opposite coast. They were meant to demonstrate, as the Nixon administration then in charge said, how to bring parks to the people. People were increasingly living in cities. The National Park Service had little presence in cities in those days. And the Nixon administration, to some people's surprise, got very strongly behind the idea of urban parks for a while. After Gateway and Golden Gate were designated and the planning began and they began to see what they were going to cost, um, they backed away from that and opposed subsequent urban park proposals that went forward anyway because the Congress was a Democratic majority. And they passed the legislation designating Cuyahoga Valley and Cleveland and Akron and uh, the Chattahoochee River in Atlanta, um, the Santa Monica Mountains in Los Angeles, um, metropolitan area, and a bunch of others. Um, one of the most interesting things, urban parks, of course, go back to our earliest history. Uh, Plaza de la Concepcion in St. Augustine, Florida, was designated in 1573, the first official urban city park in the United States. Battery Park, across the street here, uh, was not too far behind in 1684. Um, and parks have been a part of urban life from the beginning. A national role, a federal role in urban parks is a much newer thing. Um, the two gateways, the Gateway and Golden Gate in 72, were the first time that con Congress consciously said, we need what the National Park Service does in big cities. And today there are 17 areas that I would classify as urban units of the National Park System that have a major recreation role. There's lots of other smaller historic sites. There are other national natural areas, national significant natural areas that are near metropolitan areas. Um, but 17 that I, I would say are in big cities uh, bringing the National Park Service's uh, unique set of skills. not compare favorably with what has happened in the other cities, uh, to be blunt. Um, the most striking contrast is with Golden Gate. Um, even though Gateway uh, has the largest appropriation of any urban park for its operating budget, in fact, the second largest operating budget of any of the 393 units in the system, about $26 million a year uh, in current terms before the next cut happens, um, uh, second only to Yellowstone National Park. Uh, nevertheless, it hasn't had the kind of collaboration with the urban infrastructure, with the city, with the NGO community, with the philanthropic community, or with the corporate community that most of these other urban parks have enjoyed. For example, the Golden Gate National Park Conservancy in San Francisco has raised $165 million from philanthropic sources in the greater Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, into the restoration, management, and operations of uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area. 
Congress has amended the boundary of Golden Gate National Recreation Area, adding new land seven times since 1972. The Gateway New York boundary has not been amended at all by an act of Congress. The Cuyahoga Valley, and so now in Golden Gate there are 53,000 acres of federal land in that urban unit because of those sequential additions in subsequent acts of Congress. Cuyahoga Valley National Park between Cleveland and Akron was redesignated as a national park, of which there are only 52 of those 393 units, um, in, in 2000, um, giving it uh, arguably a, a higher prestige, a higher prominence, a greater visibility, putting it on the tourism map, if you will, um, for the traveling uh, America and international travelers like it never was before as a national recreation area. And I would say, too, that in those places where these urban parks have been successful, they have been seamlessly integrated with the state or municipal park systems uh, in those places in ways that have not happened here. Um, if, uh, coming, not coming from here, not being from these parts, uh, I would say that New York is very Manhattan-centric, and Gateway National Recreation Area is mostly not in Manhattan. It's mostly in the surrounding boroughs. Um, and the Golden, or the uh, Central Park Conservancy, uh, by contrast, has been hugely successful at raising private money as a nonprofit partner to New York Park and Recreation Department. Um, managing most of the programming and much of the restoration of Central Park. Holy City operation, nevertheless, largely funded these days by uh, private philanthropy and volunteerism. Um, Golden Gate, in a very similar way, but not Gateway. And we can uh, lament that fact, or we can wrestle with it, but it's, I think, time to do something about it. Um, and I would say as a parallel to these urban units, um, one of the great things that a New York congressman did, Jonathan Bingaman, in 1978, uh, was the leading sponsor of an act called the Urban Park and Recreation Recovery Act. There's a second program that the Park Service administers in addition to the units of the system um, in which they have grants and technical assistance uh, to park and recreation agencies across the country. Um, one is called the State Grants Program of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. That's existed since 1965 and is authorized, uh, any, you know, it's authorized with $900 million a year of federal money from outer continental shelf oil and gas leasing revenues and royalties. Um, it seldom gets full, fully funding, full funding. Um, but there's a grants program in that that goes to the states, and the states convey funds to the cities. Bingaman and some other urban members decided in 1978 that the cities were not getting a fair share, so they created a separate fund, UPAR, um, that was only for cities, a competitive grants program administered by the National Park Service. Um, and that fund was, was amply appropriated for, uh, in the 70s, uh, but zeroed out starting with the Reagan administration uh, in 1981 and has seldom had funding since then, even though it is still authorized and would be funded out of the same outer continental shelf oil and gas leasing receipts. Um, so Jonathan Bingaman was the father of this act, left Congress a few years after that, and there has not been an urban uh, parks or a UPAR program advocate in the Congress since then who would fight for those appropriations. Um, and that's, I think, very unfortunate. Um, new, new congressman, uh, just a couple terms ago, Ali Osiris of New Jersey, put a bill in this last session, the current session that's in lame duck um, at the moment, to authorize a HUD-funded urban parks program that would not duplicate what the Park Service administers, but would supplement it. That hasn't passed the Congress as yet, but it has over 100 co-sponsors. Um, I think I'll stop with that, and we can take up this more, and we can probe a bit if you wish.
permission when we get to questions. Terrific. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks, Destry. I think that provides a good overview. Um, I have to be cautious of my words here since Destry's brother happens to be the director of the National Park Service. So that is, as well as uh, most of the Gateway staff. That, uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is, a, this is a test for me as the acting commissioner or what, but uh, anyhow, I appreciate you being here. I think it's really important to be a part of the conversation. So it's early October. I get a phone call from my direct boss at the regional office in Philadelphia saying, Michael, can you come down? And originally the plans were to, to have a chat about uh, the national park that I'm superintendent of up, up in Lowell, Massachusetts. He closes the door. There was a couple other people that were supposed to be joining me. I'm like, did I do something really wrong? <laughs> and uh, he said, um, I, I, uh, I need you to do some hopscotch uh, with Maria Burks, who's the commissioner uh, here. And um, I need you to come from Lowell down in New York to, uh, to take care of business while she's going to be down in Washington, D.C. So two weeks later, I was in Manhattan trying to find my way over the Staten Ferry into into my office on Wall Street, and um, I can say that um, uh, I'm having a ball. I just did the Macy Parade and everything, so I'm um, <laughs> right there with you. So it's it's been a great uh, it's been a great time. My first week here, I spent a week uh, traveling through Gateway. Um, we do a thing when superintendents leave uh, called transition management assessments, and I brought in nine people from all over the country to basically take a look at Gateway with a fresh set of eyes. And I have to say, uh, I'm a big believer in taking a look at these places uh, with fresh eyes. Um, and, and at a first glance, Gateway seemed to be disconnected. Many of the historic properties seemed to be past their prime and in need of restorative work. The MPS brand didn't seem to hold together, and I never really felt like there was a there there. It was a challenge to get to places no matter what form of transportation I chose. And I was told that a national park in New York City did not carry the same status that many of our other national parks do because it was a small fish in a very big bowl. After a few weeks, though, my fresh eyes became somewhat blurred. And I talked with lots and lots of people. I looked much more closely at the resources themselves. And these places, these issues, were not unfamiliar to me at all. You see, I come from a place, another national park that's in an urban area, not quite the size of New York City, a little bit smaller, 100,000 plus, um, in Lowell, Massachusetts. This is a non-traditional urban national park that came about about five or six years later after Gateway. It was too not fully embraced by Congress, nor was it embraced by the National Park Service, with struggles with this idea of urban national parks. I'm going to talk a little bit about Lowell, but I'm going to bring it around the gateway because I think there's some real parallels here. Lowell is known for the fact that it was the, one of the first planned industrial cities in America. Unfortunately, it was also well known after a tremendous economic collapse, whereby the classic quote from the chief economist of the Bank of Boston declared, Lowell has no future. Government officials ought to stop wasting their time trying to save this city. It has no hope. Well, maybe it is because of these words, mostly from outsiders, that Lowell has within its DNA the survival instincts that allow it to continually change and innovate. It is a city that has never really backed away from its identity. If anything, it flaunts its authenticity. It is that spirit that has led to, core, to a core of civic-minded individuals, elected officials, and organizations that care about their heritage, and fought to create Lowell National Historical Park. The notion of creating a national park with the daunting challenge of preserving Lowell's historic resources without getting bogged down with the ownership of and responsibility for literally millions of square foot of vacant mills and hundreds of decaying buildings, as well as the de facto stewardship of a downtown with an ailing economy. From the start, it was obvious the National Park Service did not have the capability or the expertise to figure it out so it reached into partnerships. Most importantly, the implementation is being conducted at a high level of intergovernmental cooperation. Furthermore, it is expected that the state and federal investments through an array of incentives and controls would lead to private sector commitments. From the beginning, the community held the Park Service to high standards 
and a collaborative culture was established from the early beginnings of the park's establishment. The parallels I see between Lowell and Gateway's history are many, and it makes me ask the question, as was posed earlier by Alex, why has Gateway continued to struggle to meet the aspirations of its founders? the City of New York, members of the New York and New Jersey Congressional Delegation, the Regional Plan Association, and the visionaries like Marion High School and David Rockefeller, who advocated for the creation of this national park. Gateway is obviously complex, and I'm sure that there are many reasons that the dream has not yet been fulfilled. But the observation that strikes me as maybe the most important is that people really care about Gateway, and they see the incredible potential to become a world-renowned national park and a model for a new interface between urban communities and ecological systems. The recent reports, the path forward by the, the Regional Plan Association of the National Parks and Conservation that later led to envisioning Gateway with Columbia University and Van Allen Institute, followed up by the Floyd Ribbon Blue Ribbon panel that is uh, just about ready to put their final plans together, the transportation strategy by the National Parks of New York Harbor Conservancy, as well as many of their other plans. Plan NYC that Mayor Bloomberg has uh, led us through. The Hudson Raritan Estuary Comprehensive Plan and the National Park Service GMP, as well as this conference right here. All of those plans are just within the last couple of years. It's an indicator to me that people care about this place. It's about uh, people having a demonstration of their commitment to seeing something viable, something grand for their national park. Gateway has also attracted the interest of the Secretary of the Interior, who has challenged us to look at how we can work together in a united and coherent effort to create a seamless vision for the Hudson Raritan Estuary that includes all of Gateway. It is this confluence of planning, private fundraising, public support, and collaborative activities that gives me hope that Gateway's moment is now. It's now to define different strategies and approaches to ensure Gateway's future vitality. As the Van Allen Report states, it presents a significant regional resource with incredible infrastructural, ecological, and cultural values in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan region, hosting endangered birds, fish and shellfish breeding grounds, marinas, places of inspiration and respite, recreation, and cultural relics. Jane Brody wrote in yesterday's Times an article called Head Out for a Daily Dose of Green Space. It recognized Michelle Obama's battle against childhood obesity and her initiative to let's move outside. The aim of which is to turn our public lands into public health resources. Gateway could be a poster child for this campaign since it already has an annual visitation of over 9 million visits and access to the entire metropolitan region. New York, as I think was talked about uh, in one of the earlier sessions, has 771 miles of coastline, and the National Park Service is the largest single landowner of the Harbor Shoreline. These park lands of Jamaica Bay, Sandy Hook, and Fort Wadsworth are incredibly valuable resources. We recognize that our report card in certain areas calls for improvement, but Gateway and its many partners have resources, and together we will work towards addressing historic preservation challenges water quality, wildlife habitat improvements, park infrastructure modernization, building a robust education and interpreter program and developing a stronger brand identity throughout the entire Gateway area. Just in the last few years, the Park Service has invested $2 million in a new ferries dock system at Sandy Hook, $2 million in utility infrastructure improvements at Floyd Bennett, $6 million in rehabilitating the Ryan Visitor Center at Floyd Bennett, more than $5 million in co conduct construct the sand slurry pipeline at Sandy Hook for sand replenishment, a million bucks for Sandy Hook multiple use plan, which now has seven miles of the bike path running through it, one and a half million dollars to replace um, some of the infrastructure at both Sandy Hook as well as Floyd Bennett. And as was discussed earlier today, millions and millions of dollars invested in 80 acres of new marsh in Jamaica Bay with the Army Corps of Engineers in the state of New York and the city of New York as local sponsors. And the National Parks of New York Harbor Conservancy, our nonprofit philanthropic organization that has only been around for two, since 2004, Destry, um, can compare, I hope, to, to get a Golden Gate in the years to come, but it has raised $10 million in that time. So in closing, I'm proud to work for a public agency that is at the whole of our nation's stories, 
and the protector of some of America's most significant natural and cultural resource sites in perpetuity. The decisions we're made today need to be respectful of future generations, which means that there may be times that we need to act now on things that are in dire need of our attention before they are lost. And it also means that we need to engage a broad spectrum of individuals, businesses, and governments to accomplish all that we envision for Gateway, because the Park Service cannot go at it alone. Keep pushing us, keep supporting us, shed the egos and political boundaries, and future generations will look back and appreciate the work that we have done to make Gateway a premier national park. Thank you. Actually more than enough. Uh, thanks. So when Alex introduced me before as a strategic consultant, he was being very kind. Um, that euphemism for what I really do, which is politics, um, which is sometimes a dirty word. Um, but the reason I think Alex asked me to be here is to talk about sort of the political constituency that doesn't, in my view, exist right now that could allow Gateway to be as successful as it could be, and talk about how you can get there. Um, I ran Mayor Bloomberg's campaign last year, and I think it's sad that the words gateway did not come up once the entire campaign. So you have the single biggest park in New York City, the five boroughs, a um, campaign for running the city of New York. Um, I worked for the Parks Department for four years, so I'm highly attuned to these issues. Um, not once in a debate, a press conference, a questionnaire, uh, there's not one single instance that I can think of where anyone asks us about that issue. And I wish they had, because I care about gateway out here. Um, and yet, never came up at all. Um, to me, that's a pretty good indication of why gateway, and so far, is not what it could be. I think what we've heard so far is Michael talk about all the great attributes that gateway has. It's got incredible natural features. A lot of people actually do use it. A lot of people care about it. A lot of plans to make it even better. And as actually pointed out, it has reached its potential. It's not the Golden Gate Park. It's not anywhere near that. Um, so the question is, why and how do you fix that? And I would argue that until you can develop a real political constituency around Gateway, it's never going to get the attention it needs, the resources that it needs, or have all the things that all the people here who work at Gateway and want the tools to do their job as well as they possibly can. And it's not just maintaining the facility. It's promoting it, it's making it accessible, it's making it uh, exciting for the people of New York. Until they have those tools, they're never able to really fully do their job. Um, and, and so the question is, how do you achieve that? So here's the good news. If you look at the zip codes surrounding Gateway on the New York City side, there's 600,000 registered voters. So it's a pretty significant uh, size, what sort of block of people itself. Uh, if you look at the elected officials involved, on the congressional level, you now have bipartisan representation. Now that Staten Island's Congressman Grimm is again a Republican. Um, you've got bipartisan representation both in Albany and at the city council. So you've got people on both sides of the aisle. Uh, you've got some pretty amazing national spokespeople with giant bully pulpits. You've got Chuck Schumer, Mike Bloomberg, Andrew Cuomo in a month or so. So there's no lack of people who have the ability to make gateway a cause. However, as someone who works with politicians, for politicians, run their campaigns, bullies them into doing stuff, I will tell you that until it becomes either an enticement for them where they can get something out of it, or a problem they need to avoid by doing something about it, they're never going to deal with it. And if they don't deal with it, this guy will never have the resources he needs, I would argue, to do the job properly. So the question is, how do you do that? And I think there's sort of three parts to it. The first is, there's not enough organization yet. You know, Michael mentioned, you know, some things are happening which are great, but um, there's no pact that I'm aware of. No one endorses candidates. No one gives money to candidates. If there is social media, it's not that active or well known. So either it doesn't exist, or if it does, if I don't know about it, then it's not effective. So the first thing is, you've got to organize, and with the technology available today, it's not that hard to do, uh, because you don't have to go knock on door after door. A lot of them have been done technologically over the web. That's the first part. The second part is you need a clear, simple agenda for people. So here's what's great about parks. They're basically not controversial 95% of the time. Politicians are always looking for things to talk to the press about. It's a great cause. It's an easy hit. Um, if you think about some of the people that we need, Anthony Weiner's looking for a press hit every Sunday. Chuck Schumer, I was Chuck's press secretary. I worked every Sunday for two straight years. They're looking for stuff. So if you can give them clear, easy wins and say, 
Here are the things you could call for from the National Park Service, legislation you can do in Congress, and City Council, and the Mayor's budget in Albany, whatever it is, uh, and you give them a clear, easy agenda that they can actually act upon with some real benefit to them in the form of press or political support or anything else, they'll do it. Um, will all of them do it and follow up the way they should? No, they're politicians, but they'll start and that's what gets it going. So, so the, the first part is organizing, the second part is the carrot. The carrot comes in the form of press, the carrot comes in the form of endorsements, the carrot comes in the form of money. The third part is the stick. Um, and the other way to get people to do something is, excuse my language, to be a pain in the ass. Um, and that means calling, writing, emailing, showing up at town halls, asking them why not doing things, showing up at their office, showing up at events, showing up at press conferences. Um, you can motivate politicians to do things by simply being such a squeaky wheel that they want you to go away. Um, and they'll deal with it just to make you go away. So generally, any successful campaign has a good combination of carrot and stick, and you need both. At the moment, I don't see either. Um, I don't believe that Gateway will ever, ever have the success it needs without having both in there. Almost everything I just outlined is low cost, low dollar. Um, it's really just going to take a, a lot of sweat out of it, a lot of work, a lot of persistence, a lot of dedication. It's not easy organizing. It's, it's really hard work if most people don't want to do it. Um, but if you don't do it, I think you see what the results are. You know, in California, if you try to do something that hurts you know, Golden Gate Park, you can count on an immediate outcry that backs people off very quickly. And that's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, we don't have that kind of power in New York because we don't have that kind of constituency. So I think you get the point of what I'm saying, but the reason why Alex wanted me to, to, to come here and talk to you is we can have the greatest plans in the world, the greatest, you know, every group that is dedicated to the issue and sort of thoughtful can talk about it and, and have great ideas and great plans. I don't think they'll ever have what they need um, without the work being done on the ground. So it has to happen. Probably not giving the most uplifting talk you're going to hear all day, um, but I think it's one that, that needs to be said, needs to be heard, and if, it, if, if some of these words are sort of heated in some way, the potential is enormous. So, um, thank you very much. That was great. Um, Oliver? I guess that's why they asked me to follow up that. Because I mean, if you think about it, if, if you look at where we are today and what's happened since 2004, six years ago, we've had a state of the parks report. The park service was not happy with it. But we called it like it was in PC. We said the park is failing. Natural resources, you know. The cultural resources, the park is failing, someone needs to do something about it. Then we said, well, let's, let's have a visioning session. Contacting people all over the world to get involved in envisioning gateway. So this is what Floyd Bennett Field could, could look like. We're not even talking about funding. We're talking about vision. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about it's time after 40 years to do something. This park was created in 1972. How many of you were here in 1972? How many of you remember 1972? How many, many of you remember Vietnam and civil rights? And the crisis of why the federal government said it's time to deal with urban sprawl. It's time to create an urban national park so folks have somewhere to recreate. Park services like that's not what we do. We do cultural and natural preservation. And we don't know anything about recreation. It's that we understand that. It's time you got involved in recreation areas. The park service resisted. They're like, oh, how are we going to do this? And what happened? In a 26,000 acre park, sit for 40 years, spread over two states and three boroughs. But since 2004, we have had visions, we have had a state of the parks report, we have had recommendations going forward, we are talking with Mike increasing on, we love Gateway, we love the staff of Gateway, we now have champions. We have a senator who's interested. We have a congressman who's willing to be a champion. We have our own panel at this conference. It is time to take the opportunity to move forward and make Gateway an iconic national park. It's 
not going to be easy. It cannot happen without you. It cannot happen without NPCA, who is the best friend of the National Park Service. It cannot happen with individuals like the National Jaws, who understand how Capitol Hill works. I mean, think about New York. Think about Van Cortland. Think about Riverside. Think about Central Park. Think about Prospect Park. What's the next race open? The next great open space? Floyd Bennett Field. It doesn't matter that it's been 40 years. What matters is that time, it's our time now. We have a great staff, we have a great park service to run it, but what needs to happen? I believe there are five things. I believe there needs to be leadership. Someone has to take charge of this project. I believe that the park service was never meant to do this alone. When you talk about combining recreation and cultural and natural preservation, it sounds to me like you're also talking about there has to be a partnership with state and local park service. Because they know recreation. I also believe that there has to be an opportunity for non-traditional funding. The Department of Interior doesn't have the money to fund this. They never have. So what do we do? We get creative. We look at division. We look at other federal agencies. We look at corporations. We look at the city's pocketbook. We look at opportunities. You know, we look at the issue with education. I was in Atlanta two months ago at a, at a meeting at, at Piedmont Park. You know what they're talking about? They're talking about partnering with CDC on something called park scriptions because these kids are inside. And doctors and the AMA should be involved in pushing these kids to get outside, off these video games, into the parks. This is about health. But it's our responsibility to get creative enough to look outside the box so we can make something happen at the end. Why? Because we have the land. We have it. It's there. It's a map. It's a canvas of opportunity to get created. Forget about the last 40 years. What can we do by 2016? What can we do by 2030? We have a visionary mayor. We have a visionary president. We have a very functional Congress. <laughs> I mean, the last two, the last two points I make is about political support. And I think Bradley is absolutely right. It's about community support. We have to connect with the constituents. You got birders, you got bike riders, you got hikers, you got swimmers. You know, you got forts. I mean, there's so many opportunities if we were all working together in a reasonable time frame to try to make this happen. It's not always about fun. Ultimately, yes. In the meantime, there are things that we can do to keep Gateway in the media and the focus so we can move forward to make sure that New York has, and New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut has the iconic part that they deserve. Thank you. All the floor. That was fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. Rob? Uh, well, one of the uh, great aspects of going last is uh, you know, obviously one of the bad aspects of going last is we've had a bunch of terrific speakers and they're all a tough act to follow. Uh, one of the benefits of being the anchor is really to uh, go back and draw on a lot of what people are, have said already and talk a little bit about uh, the Blue Ribbon panel that we've been working on with Senator Schumer and Congressman Weiner and our uh, partners at the National Parks Conservation Association. Um, let me start with what Alex mentioned. Hey, Alex was right here in this room, the collector's room. And, you know, if you think about this room and what it represents, you know, when the Customs House was built, uh, Customs Duties was the chief revenue source for the United States of America. And, uh, lo and behold, the folks who held that power built a nice place for themselves. <laughs> you know, it's shocking, I know, but uh, human nature being what it is, that's what happened. And I think part of what we need to be thinking about, and this goes to a lot of what folks talked about, was, uh, you know, how do we make Gateway, how do we make Floyd Bennett feel, you know, that kind of fulcrum, that center of attention? Because clearly, one of the issues that it is, it's always had is that it's never been Central Park in the eyes of New York. And, um, 
you know, I, I think we all agree that its time has come, that New York has progressively made the Harbor District, you know, with Governor's Island and uh, Hudson River and Brooklyn Bridge Park and East Side of Manhattan, the Manhattan Greenway, uh, and a bunch of other parts of the western shores of Brooklyn, great. And we need to keep moving that vision and taking that um, imperative uh, and moving it forward out into, out into the gateway uh, and for that in particular. Um, you know, we talked about uh, sort of the reasons, I think Mike and Industry talked about why Gateway was established. Uh, and, you know, those reasons are even more true today, right? The country, compared to 1972, more urban today, right? We have more people living in urban areas uh, than we did in 1972. Uh, the country today, more diverse. You know, people, many more people who, uh, you know, don't for them the American experience uh, that the National Park Service tries to convey um, is foreign, right? I mean, these people don't have that cultural uh, kind of touchstones uh, that uh, native-born people have. Um, and they're located primarily right here in those places, in those zip codes, uh, around Gateway National Recreation Area. So Gateway, again, in perfect position to kind of convey the American story, convey the American experience uh, to new immigrants, uh, to folks whose children are our first generation. Um, and, uh, you know, third, when you think about sort of the challenges uh, of the 21st century, you know, climate change uh, is obviously first and foremost in many people's minds. And, uh, you know, Gateway is at sea level, right? And we want them to need to say a lot more. Um, so for all those reasons, uh, you know, Gateway is in the right place. It's the right idea. You know, maybe 40 years later, you know, it's time that we can do something about it. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Oliver mentioned a lot of the great work that MPCA uh, conducted, the Envisioning uh, Gateway uh, Study and Design Charette, uh, work we did together on the path forward. Uh, we were fortunate in that Senator Schumer and Congressman Weiner kind of heard us and took up this cause and have taken it on, uh, the idea of becoming the champions of the park. And um, they have created a 16-member uh, panel because what's clear, and I like a lot of folks touched on this, is that uh, you know, gateways uh, about is you know these urban parks don't exist in isolation. They are part of the city fabric. They are part of uh, both you know the fabric in terms of the urban infrastructure that's here, uh, in terms of the communities that are here, uh, you know, in terms of, of the future of the city and thinking about us as a as a as a place. Um, and so what what the center and congressmen have done is brought together uh, city and state and other federal agencies that work in and around uh, Gateway, uh, in Floyd Bennett Field in particular. Uh, they've brought together sort of planners uh, and advocates from, uh, that can provide some perspective um, on, on this issue. Uh, and they brought together the borough presidents to represent the community voices at the table. Uh, we as staff of the panel have undertaken a series of meetings with uh, we had a couple of very well attended community meetings out in, out in uh, around Jamaica Bay. Um, we've had meetings with uh, folks representing sort of the infrastructure and trusts in and around the bay, um, folks representing the concessionaires that currently operate in Floyd Bennett Field, uh, as well as a meeting uh, with educators. Because I think we all see, and again, maybe one of the other reasons why Gateway's time has come is that, uh, you know, education, I think, is foremost on people's minds, and whether it's, you know, uh, Park descriptions, which is a great new uh, term, uh, new to me, um, or uh, no child left out inside, or any of the other initiatives that are out there. Um, you know, again, Gateway can provide that outdoor experience that uh, is lacking, you know, sadly lacking, in so many kids' lives. Um, so, um, you know, doing all that work, uh, it's clear that uh, you know, Floyd Bennett Field has some great uses, and people love it. But that it's 1,400 acres, you know, again, as was mentioned previously, the largest, uh, perhaps the largest unutilized parcel uh, on the waterfront. 
let me just uh, give a little bit of a hint uh, as to kind of what they're going to, and again, I think some of these touch on what's been, what, what's been mentioned. You know, first of all, I think what the panel has acknowledged is that um, you need to make the brand, the gateway brand, the Floyd Bennett Field brand, a uh, real, from the moment you come down Flatbush Avenue and enter the park, that right now Floyd Bennett Field feels like uh, a old airport that was abandoned about 40 years ago. There's a lot of interesting stuff, you know, uh, cool activities, it's, you know, incredible vistas, um, incredible birding, uh, incredible recreation, uh, community gardens, uh, all kinds of stuff that's going on there, but um, you don't feel like you're in a national park the way you should. Uh, and so I think that, that's a lot of the recommendations are going to touch on that, to make that experience real uh, for every visitor. Uh, secondly, and I think this is endemic to any uh, any of these waterfront parks that we've been talking about, um, you know, they're all not so close to where people live. Uh, they're not all uh, very well connected to transit. Um, and it's always kind of this chicken or egg problem. Is it about the program and the attractors, or is it about the access, you know, and making make it easier for people to get to? Well, I think it's true, uh, and again, you know, for every park, you know, it's the whole chicken coop, right? I mean, you need both access and programming to draw people in. Uh, and we need to be thinking about utilizing uh, Floyd Bennett Field in sort of innovative uh, ways, maybe interim uses. Uh, we need to do a better job of marketing uh, in terms of what's out there, reaching out to different audiences. Uh, and, and then we also need to be making it easier for people to get to the park, whether it's via ferry, uh, whether it's via uh, the New York City Transit Services, the bus uh, that runs down Flatbush Avenue. Uh, whether it's through kind of one-off marketing events and a beach bus, uh, or whether it's through uh, the Jamaica Bay Greenway and, and better bicycle access, and taking you know sort of seizing out uh, the bicycle revolution that's that's happening here in the city. Um, and then the third thing that that really needs to happen, and again a number of people have touched on this, is that you know we need partnerships, and whether we're talking about capital P partnerships uh, with the Secretary of Interior or Mayor Bloomberg shaking hands. Or we're talking about a bunch of little key partnerships with uh, community groups and users and interim programming and all kinds of other things happening. Um, you know, the National Park Service, it's just too big, you know, and, and like any of these great parks that are happening here in the city, they're not happening by themselves. Uh, so they need to, we need to figure out the right structure for facilitating those partnerships um, and, and make them happen at every level. Um, so let me close there and turn it back over to Alex. Thank you, Rob. Thank all you panels. It's absolutely terrific. Uh, Bradley certainly said I had a lot of work for us to do, so <laughs> I'm not looking forward to tomorrow. We've got the long list to get going on. Uh, but, but Mike and Jesse have also laid out some good groundwork and places to go, such as UPAR and so forth. And uh, Oliver, you've been inspiring, so we're set. Um, Want to go to uh, questions for the audience? Sure. Yeah, um, I, I thought it was very interesting actually uh, the envisioning gateway project. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting that you set out the problem in a way that dealt with two scales. You know, first you had the scale of the whole park, I and mean, this gets to the identity because you know what is what is gateway and this whole big park, and then there's a little bit of field, which you know, everybody sort of focus on because it's the biggest area. And I guess what I didn't really hear today is sort of that same, I think that, that kind of two-pronged approach of tagging the sort of double scale is something that um, was, was probably, uh, I found that actually I, I have to say that we were one of the uh, people that were commanded on that. But so the idea of, of coming at it from two prongs, though, I think is, a, is something worth building on. You know, somewhere you started and that you should build on because I think the identity of Floyd Bennett Field is kind of uh, in a way different than the identity of the whole park. I mean, our very simple idea was to just say, why not make a, a green way going around the whole, you know, the whole bay. You know, that's kind of ambitious and it's kind of dumb dumb, but it's sort of Bradley was saying, you know, you need something very specific and, and um, doable or, and, and that requires partnerships to get people all working together. And then you can also work on some kind of field. So I, I just think the thing that, that Oliver started with this group and the competition should be forgotten that there's there's really many pieces of how do you think about it the various skills that Oliver has. I guess it's not really a question. <laughs> Great, thank you. 
Any additional thoughts on it? Well, just in response, I mean, Division and Gateway, as great of an exercise as it was, um, the hope is that the conversation continues. I mean, we really don't care as an organization how it's designed. That's the professional's job. That's my job. So that's your job. That's the employees that work at Gateway. What's encouraging for us is that the competition itself has raised the level of conversation and discussion about Floyd Benefield and Gateway. So thank you. Great. Also come 
back to a point that I made or started to make earlier, and that is comparing Gateway and Golden Gate. One of the things that these other urban parks have had that Gateway has lacked is strong leadership. Um, former California Congressman Phil Burton, who represented San Francisco, was the chairman of the National Park Subcommittee for a number of years, and that's when Gateway or Golden Gate really expanded. Uh, former Ohio Congressman Ralph Regula, who represented the district that Cuyahoga Valley is in, was chairman of the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee. And, Gate and Cuyahoga expanded, became a national park, got lots of money, etc. Um, since Jonathan Bingaman left the Congress and is now deceased, um, there hasn't been anyone prominent in the Congress who advocates for Gateway as a place, Gateway as a nationally significant place that deserves a higher level of attention, whether it's a boundary change or adequate funding or the kinds of community partnerships that these other places have. I mean, that leadership doesn't have to be a member of Congress. It can be a strong nonprofit organization or it can be the mayor, but somebody has to be the advocate for this place or it doesn't ever rise to the level of development, funding, visibility, sophistication, 